To begin this evening, I am pleased to introduce Professor Chester, Chester Gillis, a member of the Department of Theology, where he holds the Amaturo Chair in Catholic Studies. He is the founding director of the program on the church and interreligious dialogue within the Berkeley Center. Professor Gillis has served on the faculty of Georgetown since 1988, was chair of the Department of Theology until 2006, and is currently interim dean of Georgetown College. Gillis's research interests include comparative religion and contemporary Roman Catholicism. He is the author of a number of books in these areas, including the co-editor of the Columbia University series, Religion and Politics. He is currently working on a new edition of his Roman Catholicism in America and a book on interreligious marriage tentatively titled, Two Shall Become as One, Interreligious Marriage in America. He is frequently consulted by the media about contemporary issues in religion, especially about Roman Catholicism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Chester Gillis. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, if you're waiting for those books to come out, keep waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting as well for the ones I'm working on. To our distinguished panel of participants, let me add my welcome to Georgetown University, to audience members from the Georgetown community and the greater Washington, D.C. area. Thank you for joining us for what we believe will be a unique conversation about the state of political theologies and their influence historically, now, and going forward. I have two roles which permit me to offer these introductory remarks. I am the interim dean of Georgetown College, and I am a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center. However, I am here mostly because I am a theologian with deep personal and professional interests in this conversation. When I began studying theology, political theology was associated with the Catholic theologian Johann Baptist Metz, who sought to interrupt the comfortable lives of first world privileged Christians with the sober reminder that their comfort comes at the expense of the poor and the disenfranchised, and by recalling dangerous memories of atrocity in order to prevent more of them in the future, and by the Reformed theologian Jürgen Moltmann, who in his theology of hope focused on an eschatological understanding of Christian religion. Both, of course, were European. Since that time, political theology has expanded geographically and across religions, as witnessed by works such as the Blackwell Companion to Political Theology, published in 2006, that includes Muslim and Jewish views on the topic, though the book is devoted mostly to Christian theology, a continuing bias in the West. While Weber and Habermas have argued that religion belongs in the private domain, those who espouse political theologies generally favor religion's engagement with public and civic life. However, the contemporary task of political theology is complicated by the fact that some believers do not want to participate in a public life that includes believers from other religions and non-believers, and that some secularists do not want religion of any type to have a voice in public life. However, I think that even if we surrender to either of these constituencies, it does not mean that there will be no public narrative at all. Most do not pine for a Christian America, to use the title of Robert Handy's work of some 40 years ago, which is hegemonic over other religious identifications and non-religious worldviews, since this may be neither wise nor possible in pluralistic America. It is also naive to think that life is morally neutral, since values are implicit in laws and public policies. The disestablishment of religion required by the Constitution should not mean the establishment of secularism as a replacement for religion. Political life, like religious life, is directed to a comprehensive purpose. Both political and religious views, then, should be subject to evaluation. In a democracy founded on the separation of church and state, political activity can be evaluated by religious criteria, and religious activity 
can be evaluated by political criteria. Religious persons participate in and contribute to public activity and values, and they must recognize that others who hold different views also participate in these activities and construct values. In his Democracy and Tradition, using the method of pragmatism, Jeffrey Stout has argued that adherence to religions do not encounter incommensurability when discussing an ethics that will be inclusive and public, but others disagree somewhat and argue instead that the Christian story stands in opposition to culture and or that there is a fundamental incommensurability between the Christian message and the way that contemporary culture functions morally. The tension between political and narrative theology is discussed and even heatedly argued in the pages of arcane journals of theology. The so-called radical orthodoxy proposed by Stanley Harawas and John Milbank favors a narrative theology to, in which the Christian story stands in opposition to culture. Among Christian theologians, some, such as Mary Doak, see an opposition between political and narrative theology that must be overcome, and a public Christian theology created which informs and even shapes social, cultural, political, and religious discourse in America. She further insists that international concerns, while important, as stressed by Metz, do not negate the need to attend to national politics as a way to address global issues. Whatever shape the narrative of contemporary political theology takes, some, such as Cornell West, argue that it cannot simply be the story of the powerful Christian white male elite, but ideally includes the economically deprived, the socially marginalized, ethnic minorities, women, and representatives of all religions, as well as the voices of those who are not religiously identified. On the one hand, this makes the conversation more complicated. On the other hand, it makes it more inclusive and certainly more interesting. Christianity comforts its followers, but it must also challenge them and society at large, something in West's view it has largely failed to do. Racism, homophobia, and patriarchy have coexisted all too conveniently with Christianity and American culture. West calls for a radical democracy that enfranchises all citizens and in particular cases, cares for those on the margins of society. American society is not only privatized, he argues, it is also balkanized, especially along racial lines. Thus, political theologies must confront social issues head on. This conference brings together experts in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, indicating that political theology is not the sole provenance of one religion. The conversation must be within religious traditions and between religious traditions. Political theology is not confined to Christian discourse as it was when I began studying theology. Georgetown's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs is ensuring that the conversation is international and interreligious. In this conference, some of the best scholars will explore how globalization, secularization, and pluralism affect political theologies. Jurgen Moltmann has argued that truth is to be found in unhindered dialogue rather than in theological systems and assertive dogmatics. We are here to engage in that dialogue. Thank you and welcome. I would like to make one note about a very important set of events happening next week. The Berkeley Center annually has a Berkeley Center lecture series where we bring in a prominent scholar um, for a, an extended period of time. Um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Charles Taylor will be delivering a series of lectures um, in this auditorium. Um, and it starts at 4.30 PM on Tuesday and the time changes on Wednesday, but there's a poster out front, so if you're interested, you should um, grab the poster and you can see the times. Um, the, the lecture series is titled Narratives of Secularity, 
Um, the individual lectures are called uh, Master Narratives of Modernity, Disenchantment and Secularity, and a more uh, adequate narrative of Western secularity. So I encourage you to attend. As well, uh, tomorrow, as, um, as Dean Gillis mentioned, um, there's a number of very smart people um, out in the audience who will be sharing their views about the uh, emerging trends in political theologies um, starting at 1015, um, and there will be three panels. Those will be held in Copley Formal Lounge, which is um, the building on the other side of Red Square when you walk into this building. I am now pleased to welcome my mentor and friend, Professor Mark Lilla, back to Georgetown. He joined us last um, spring for a conversation with Jose Casanova. Mark joins us from Columbia University, where he is professor of the humanities and in the Department of Religion. Professor Lilla was trained at the University of Michigan and Harvard University, from where he received his PhD in 1990. He has held positions at New York University, Oxford University, and most recently, and where I met him, um, in the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. His work ranges widely in the history of ideas, though his central concerns lately have been the relation between religion and politics and the legacy of the modern Western Enlightenment. His books include G.B. Vico, The Making of an Anti-Modern, uh, 1993, The Reckless Mind, Intellectuals in Politics, 2001, and most recently, The Stillborn God, Religion, Politics, and the Modern West, 2007. His current research focuses on the religious concepts of conversion and innocence. Joining Mark this evening is Professor John Milbank, Professor in Religion, Politics, and Ethics at the University of Nottingham. He is the author of several books, of which the most well-known is perhaps Theology and Social Theory, and his most recent is Being Reconciled, Ontology, and Pardon. He is one of the editors of the Radical Orthodoxy collection of essays, which occasioned much debate around the globe in theological circles and elsewhere. In general, he has endeavored in his work to resist the idea that secular norms of understanding should set the agenda for theology, and has tried to promote the sense that Christianity offers a rich and viable account of the whole of reality. A quick note about format. For about the next 45 minutes, I will moderate a discussion between Professors Lilla and Milbank about their work and thoughts on emerging trends in political theologies. In the spirit of the evening, uh, we will be um, adjourning by 8, and of course, when I ask questions, they have um, every flexibility of ignoring my questions and talking about what they would like. <laughs> we will then have ample time for discussion with audience members. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, and now please join me in welcoming Professors Lilla and Milbank. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to begin by letting you um, give us some sense of where you both think that the developments in political theologies are headed, both within the traditions that you study and also around the globe. It's a term that has reemerged as a, as a descriptor to capture a whole complex set of phenomena. It's not clear what the term means. One of the drivers for this conference was to help gain some clarity uh, by engaging in a conversation among a number of scholars um, who are working in this field in some way. So I'll first ask uh, that question of John, and then uh, Mark can follow up. Um, yes, I think that's a, a difficult question. I think it's important to stress that political theology is not a traditional term at all. Um, and I think that's significant. You know, there are theological treatments of the area of politics. Um, the term political theology in its kind of second incarnation, though, tended to suggest theologies whose entire horizon is political, if we're thinking of people like Metz. Um, and this is an approach I would uh, strongly reject, not leastly because I think it lands you up with a less rather than a more radical uh, and critical approach to, to politics if you decide that the entire horizon is political. Um, I think I'm, I'm far more interested, though, in the first incarnation of the term in Carl Schmitt, the criticism of Schmitt by Eric Peterson, and the conversations they were both having with Ernst uh, Kantorowicz. Uh, I think that body of work is 
of far greater significance. Um, but in a way, this was not theology so much as an attempt to talk about the way in which our discourse in the West about politics is far more theological than we imagine. And I think this probably is of relevance to the kind of things that uh, Mark and I might talk about. So that Schmidt you know, kicked off by suggesting that the entire theory of sovereignty is somehow irreducibly theological. Um, and Peterson replied by saying, yes, but it's heterodox and it relates to voluntaristic deviations and it's incompatible actually with um, Trinitarian theology. And then Kantorovitz joined in uh, by talking about the ways in which the models of rule in the West were not just theological but also Christological um, in, in his book, uh, uh, The King's Two Bodies. And I think this work carries on. Um, a couple, few weeks ago, um, a Gambon was uh, at our, I'm also the director of the Center of Theology and Philosophy at Nottingham. My, my deputy would be furious if, if I didn't advertise that. And Giorgio Gambon was at our conference in Rome, and he was talking very interestingly about uh, the idea with a, a lot of people have put forward recently that the entire obsession with the economic in the West is in the end somehow Christian, although also a distortion of the Christian, that the idea of economia, of, of, of adaptation, um, you know, the, the economic trinity and so on, has got more to do with the, the discourse of economics than we might imagine. I think this is sort of continuing um, this tradition, um, which tends to sort of undermine the idea that we're living in pure secularity. I mean, in relation to um, Marx's uh, extremely interesting book. I've, I think, you know, one of the questions I've raised to him would be, aren't you eliding the fact that actually Hobbes is a political theologian? And, and that in some ways, you know, you're saying, oh, he ends political theology. But on the contrary, you could say he starts, begins to invent it because he reads the Bible entirely within a political horizon. You know, that's, that's part of the point of Leviathan, that he's saying, actually, the message of the Bible is political. Um, uh, it's not uh, a spiritual message at all. And this is part of the moves he's making so that, you know, it's not quite as yet an outright secular argument. I'm, I'm just mentioning that because it's, it's one example, I think, of the argument that we're, we're, we're sort of not as secular as we appear because we're using kind of bric-a-brac um, from the theological past. And so I suppose a lot of my endeavours have been arguing that the secular isn't as, as secular as it appears. Um, it's extremely difficult to have the purely secular. Um, and in fact, I would turn this round to the paradox that only if you have the church and acknowledge the role of the church do you have the secular, because somehow it's the idea of the church that relativized the political and made it secular. And once you don't have the church, then what you tend to have is a resacralization of the political order rather than simply secularity. And I, I think this is the strongest part of Marx's book. I think the argument from Rousseau onwards was very, very powerful. And I, I really agreed with most of that. But I think I want to generalize that more. I'm not sure it's just German Protestants for whom this is true. Um, for example, I mean, France is... The, the whole role of civil religion in, in, in Republican France is far more important than, than certainly Germans think. They tend to think the French are all sexy atheists, but this is a German delusion. <laughs> the French are much more religious, I think. Than, they are today far more religious than the, than the Germans. And, and I think that... Um, so, so therefore, this, this question of somehow you get rid of the church and, and actually the whole structure of... The, the, the relative division between the secular and the sacred starts to become problematic, that, that either you get the re-sacralization the re of the secular or, or else you get a totally kind of banalized secular that, that is sort of formal and empty, and then the trouble is then that it's purely about power. And in a way, I felt kind of that's what you're recommending, Mark, because in a way you're saying... Hobbes is wrong about religion, but we've got to pretend. That's the ignoble lie has to be, let's pretend Hobbes is right about religion. Because 
Um, the Rousseau, Rousseau is right about religion, but that's far too dangerous because Rousseau realizes that religion is the prime force that drives us to, to drive sociality. But Hobbes pretends that, like Richard Dawkins, that religion is just a silly mistake. But you're saying, in a way you're saying, um, and this might be a functionalist argument for why we've got Dawkins and Hitchens, and my God, that's all they deserve. You know, I'm usually against functionalist analyses, but in this case, I'm going to uh, turn functionalist. I mean, maybe, maybe it's because you need to reduce religion to the trivial. That's the only way that you can kind of guarantee the secular. You know, if you say religion is all based on fear and, 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 and all, all the rest of it. But, it's, it's, you know, it's very unlikely to succeed because, it, you know, I think another problem, um, and, you know, I'm guilty here as much as you, is that, you know, really reality isn't based on books a lot of the time. You know, really American Britain aren't based on Hobbes and Locke. Um, up to 1945, England was based on Anglicanism. Um, to, to a far greater extent than people realize. It wasn't based on Hobbes and Locke. Um, and, and, you know, it's only kind of retrospectively that we say, oh, this is the great tradition and these people came along and everybody stopped doing what they were doing before. And You know, it's, it, it's a retrospective argument, as, you know, a lot of historians have, 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 uh, have now shown. So, I, for me, um, I'm rambling on far too much. For me, political theology is partly this objective, critical thing, showing that we're not as secular as we imagine. And then, obviously, also, um, I want to have a theology of the political. And um, for me, this would be a kind of development of Augustine City of God, but Mark. Okay. Um, I guess I'll talk about my, my book in a second. Um, uh, just to maybe correct some understanding, at least about the intentions um, of the book. But in terms of your original question, um, I was interested just to see in, in reading um, theology and social theory the past week to see how much common ground we have. No, definitely. And, there was much more than I thought there would be. Um, you know, the, I, I use the metaphor of being, you know, the other Georgetown shore. Georgetown brings people together. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's a recognition on both our sides that um, there's a break, at least in thought, and that there are two shores, and we're sort of looking at each other from the opposite shores, mm -hmm. um, uh, with an, uh, a disdain for those who think that they can somehow negotiate the middle mm -hmm. uh, by uh, developing a liberal theology, or as you point out correctly in your book, to, to kind of paste on top of some theological system, some sociology borrowed from the latest mm -hmm. theological center, and that the only theology worthy of the name is a theology that, as you said in your introductory remarks, tries to account for the whole. Mm -hmm. And sure. politics is part of the whole. Yeah. And, um, uh, so I think we agree entirely on that picture. And uh, I don't know where political theology is today. We're, what I, th I feel I know something about is, is the forgetfulness of the alternative of political theology. And despite the fact that we're living, uh, or even, you know, I prefer the term theology of the political. Um, you know, we're living in a world where there's one that's well developed now that we all have to think about. Um, and we're, we keep uh, floundering about and thinking about our own political experience yeah. um, in trying to figure out what to do with religion. It's because we have not, um, we've forgotten that there was once a great struggle over um, how to think about what for me is the essential issue. And here I'll get to how I use the term political theology. And that is um, the legitimation of public authority. Um, I, I'm not interested in political, th I'm not talking about what Schmidt is talking about, uh, nor am I talking about what uh, Metz and Mortmann are talking about. I'm talking, I've, I've tried in my book to do a couple of things that are in contrast to what John does, um, and Charles Taylor as well, and that is to focus on one 
narrow intellectual problem, and that is how you legitim legitimize the exercise of public authority. And to see, to, to examine how that, uh, the difference between uh, legitimating on the basis of a divine revelation is, is different from uh, trying to legitimate it without that appeal. I'm not interested in secularization. I have nothing to say about that. I'm not interested in the secular society. Unlike John and Charles Taylor, um, I, um, as your friend Haman once said about, um, about theories like Kant's, uh, someone looks upon them, uh, the, a wise man looks upon them the way a wise girl looks upon a love letter, i.e. skeptically. You know? um, and I look at all, the, they're sort of genealogy junkies. Uh, the books begin saying, you know, we've got a contemporary problem, but to explain that, let me go back to the 11th century. And then you have to spin out a whole story that then is to replace someone else's story. And it's as if you can't write about or think about these things without telling a new story. These are just so stories, they're fairy tales that we use to try to orient ourselves in the present. Um, so I have nothing to say about how society got secularized, whether the term is appropriate or not. I'm interested in one thing only, and that is how we've come to legitimate the public authority that we exercise today. Nor have I tried to explain how that sort of fled, uh, how that trickled down from books into action. Uh, the book, The Reckless Mind, is about the logic of an argument. What happens when you make another assumption about how authority can be legitimated, and what other possible chess moves open up on the basis of that? Other people can worry about how or whether those ideas trickle down the presence of, of, uh, of religion simultaneously with a new uh, legitimation of public authority. So I think it's crucial to uh, at least decide for the purpose of of the conference, um, whether you want to talk about, I guess we mentioned three things now. One is um, a distinction between political theology and, po and political philosophy that focuses just on the question of authority. A larger uh, view of uh, everything being politically theological or theologically political, a la Schmidt, down through Agamben and the rest. Um, or if you want to talk about a theology that understands uh, politics as part of its vision of the whole. Um, and on that last question, I don't know if you want to continue asking questions. I, 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 have, I have lots to ask uh, John, but may, maybe Michael, you want to well, pose I wanna, another question. I want to start by asking, or I want to continue by asking uh, John a question that I think will help tease out some understandings of radical orthodoxy, which sure. is the movement that you're most well known for and something that I think it might help uh, some people in the audience who may be yeah. unfamiliar with your work. Um, I, and I, I'm going to start in a weird way. We, were both, uh, mm -hmm. we both wrote essays for a feshrift for Jean-Luc Marion's um, work. Uh, and in, um, you uh, mentioned, in, not necessarily in that, in that piece, but in another piece, that Marion has a, a bleakly Pascalian view of love which requires handing the physical world, political society, and positive and humane science over to an inevitable lovelessness. And again, in Christ the Exception, a, a small essay, he wrote, we are to imitate Christ and to love ecstatically through exchange, losing our lives in order to gain them. But if only Christ reconciles us to each other, nation to nation, race to race, sex to sex, ruler to subordinate, person to person, then this can only mean that the specific shape of Christ's body in his reconciled life and its continued renewal in the church provides for us the true aesthetic example for our reshaping of our social existence. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in what you view as the contribution of and the critique of um, the theologies of the political, uh, that radical orthodoxy. Absolutely. I mean, I think what you've just said shows that it's not quite right to say that I'm kind of against culture. I'm not a Bartian at all. Uh, in fact, I think Barth's a kind of inverted liberal. And actually, I 
really agree with Mark that it's, it, it, it's kind of um, insane apocalyptic. And he never quite gets rid of that. Gets rid of that yeah. and, he, and you're actually right. Most theologians are going to disagree with you, but I actually agree with you. Um, and, because, and because there's no mediation at all, in a strange kind of way, he lets everything stand. You know, it's sort of any politics is like bad. And I'm not saying that at all. I'm, uh, you know, there's a line in the introduction to the RO volume that says, compared to Bart, we're more mediating but less accommodating. And, and that's the point, that we believe in a, in a, in a kind of specific refraction of culture. Um, and a, another way that I'd like to relate um, what, what I've done to what Mark says is, is this word um, reconciliation. I thought another very good book, bit in your book was we saying you, you're insisting that this idea in Christianity that we're reconciling is very, very important. And that's the point where it's not simply kind of otherworldly and, and suggests something that goes um, a bit beyond the political. But I, I suppose at that point, that's where I think for us ecclesiology is much more important than in, in most political theologies, certainly than in the case of um, um, liberation theology. The idea that the church itself is, 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 as the anticipation of the kingdom, is kind of the project of the real society. And this goes beyond political purposes um, for two reasons. Um, first of all, because it posits what I call an ontology of peace. So that I agree with Pierre Manon, who hovers, I think, in the background of your book at certain points, um, when he says that liberalism actually um, assumes the priority of evil. I think this is very, very important, that it's reactive. It assumes that the worst is dominant. And so it's linked to agonistic ontologies. And this you know, remains the case with, with Hegel and, and with, with ideas that you must assume that evil is primary, this is true for Levinas too, or that you must kind of pass through evil to get to the good and, and so on. Whereas I think that Christianity is committed to a counter ontology of um, sort of original harmony and peaceableness which is ruptured by the fall, but, but the thing about the fall is that it doesn't ontologize evil. It makes it, con it, makes it all pervasive, but it doesn't have a theory about it. It's, it, it, it's it, contingent. Can I ask you a question yeah. just on that point, yeah. and, then, and then you can go on? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what makes you say that um, liberal, liberalism ontologizes evil. The account I would give is that, it's actually close to something I suppose Niebuhr would say, which is that, um, Politics is one thing that we do that copes with our interaction on the assumption of the worst. And that this is a type of thinking about politics yep. that puts evil first because it puts first, though there are other ways of thinking about politics, preventing the worst things we can do to each other. Now, you can say that's a thin way to think about ourselves, but liberalism isn't committed to an ontology. It says, for the purposes of this part of human interaction, mm -hmm. let us choose to focus on this, okay. and let us think about the family not like that. And let us yeah. think about, right? And then, uh, but it's like you're yearning for liberalism, yeah. and, and you're positing to liberalism a kind of view of the whole mm -hmm. that it was invented to reject. Mm -hmm. that for the purposes of politics, we don't need to do that. I, I think that's a very American pragmatist take on, on European liberalism, which, you know, take Hobbes, it clearly is linked to an ontology, to, to an atomistic on, on, on ontology. Um, and, um, you know, in general, it's, it's linked to some kind of theory of human nature, which tends to bring begin with the individual, and then that's linked into metaphysical nominalism, and the lines from Occam onwards here are, are very, very, sure. are very, very clear, I think. And, and I mean, but, I agree, you could, you, could, um, you could read it that way. Um, what do you do, the, about, what do, you but, do about Montesquieu? Now, now, there's yeah. no ontology there. I mean, Hobbes, yes, you can make yeah, the okay. argument, but you know, those are the figures that really matter in the development of liberalism. I mean, French liberalism, mm -hmm. from Montesquieu to Tocqueville, 
ferocious. I mean, you know, it, well, it, it, it's easy yeah. to be selective and then yeah, uh, I, develop that kind of picture. Well, I think there are ontological assumptions in the background, but, you know, let's, for the sake of argument, say that this is, uh, you know, completely pragmatic. Um, there's, there's still something here being said about... Um, um, about well, about human nature, I think, because you're you're talking about um, what should be dominant collectively. You know what what are the priorities collectively, and uh, and and, and basically you land up saying that um, when it comes to the collective dimension, um, you know we have to we have to focus on. On, on, on negative things, um, and this relates always, I think, to some kind of individualism. But you know that the primary thing, the primary things are that people are struggling against each other, or the primary things that are people are sort of pursuing um, economic self-interest. So you land up with this uh, suspension between the individual and the absolute sovereign state. Or, on the other hand, because all these doctrines tend to be linked to arguments for why you must have an absolute kind of monopoly of power at, at the center. So this is, you know, these approaches are definitely ruling out you know, higher purposes for politics of, shall yeah. we say, the, the classical kind. Um, and there are all kinds of problems about those, that they, you know, they sacralized city-states, they excluded most people, and so on. But this is where I think that the, the Christian invention of ecclesia, which is, I think, something like... I, I don't go with all these too simplistic Christian left things. I think, I think the Christian project is something like the paradoxical democratizing of the noble. That, you know, whereas antique democracy could only think in terms of a kind of lowest common denominator, and this is the problem for the left even today, that it tends to say, let's just have the worst. I think the whole point about Ecclesia is, you know, Paul writes to everybody, says, have I not said you're all kings? that it, it's somehow saying that nobility, the virtues, um, are, you know, because it's sort of redefining the virtues around love, can be democratic. But at the same time, there's still a hierarchy because some people are more virtuous than others. And this is why, increasingly, I insist that Christian politics cuts across all our secular categories, including our, our left-right categories, you know, which, which in a way are just you know, post-revolutionary stuff. I think people who are critical of capitalism now, and I believe we have to go beyond capitalism, also have to go beyond the left. That because um, the left, the whole idea of the left is just not critical enough. We have to face up to the fact that the left has not managed to sustain a critique of capitalism because it's not deep enough. I have no problem. Uh, and, and, this is why, and this is why I think Christianity is moving back into the center of... Of, of political um, um, and thinking. And, and this is why I think Ecclesia, if you like, it reinvents this idea of the politics of virtue, but it says it's more than the political. It's a, it's a community of reconciliation so that everything to do with sort of coercion, um, like you know, war, punishment, policing, all these sort of things, by Augustine are regarded with semi-suspicion. Um, that, you know, because we've got to go beyond that towards reconciliation, you know, um, not just live and let live, but actual reconciliation. And this has to be something, this is why I talk about the aesthetic, that it has to be something like, um, it's, it's the kind of thing Jean-Luc Nancy talks about, that it's the, the something about community that's ineffable. You know, it's, 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 it's a tradition. And somehow... Um, the Catholic tradition is a tradition of how you bind lots of different concrete cultures without surrendering their concreteness, nonetheless, yeah. into something universal. And this is why the Catholic project is the only project that does this, it, seem, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah, um, and, 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 and that's precisely the thing uh, that... But, it, but, but Yeah, sorry, can I just say this now? Because is, isn't it, doesn't that idea, in a way, resolve your Rousseau versus Hobbes prior, aporia? I mean, if you can allow sure. that... I mean, you see, I read your book as an argument for Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Seriously. Um, well, it sort of... Because that, it's that's the alternative. Protestantism doesn't work. Yeah, well, well, well that's the alternative I uh, actually I take seriously. But I want to press you on that because in reading your book, um, 
I was trying to, um, it's long. Too long. Yeah. yeah. The, you, yeah. I, I don't have your elegant concision. But yeah, I, I, that, I felt you, you, you never met a digression you didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, no, that's uh, Ron Williams. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to work, work out the argument, and I keep losing the set. Yeah. Uh, are you OK? OK. Um, I, I was trying to figure out just what you meant by ecclesiology. And tell me if I had the steps of the argument right. Uh, to begin with, you say that Christi Christian theology must be ecclesiology. Second, you reject uh, the church-state distinction as somehow being, in your terms, ontological or fundamentally there. Yeah. And then you make the argument, I think, for the withering away of the state. Let me read you something. Um, the good ruler must reduce the scope of the political precisely insofar as he is a good ruler. Mm -hmm. And you call the state the anti-church. Now, that seems to leave no, me no with the conclusion that you're thinking about a new post-political community with a mission of salvation. And I'll quote something else. Um, the church enacts the vision of paradisal community or else it promotes a hellish society beyond all tenors known to antiquity. Corruptio optima pessima. What can go wrong will go wrong. Um, do I have you right? Well, in, 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 in summary, you, you have me right. Um, I, I guess that um, when, uh, what I'm talking about in terms of things going wrong is something like the kind of things that Ivan Illich and now Charles Taylor talk about as well, that, and, and that Foucault picks up, that sort of when the project of reconciliation becomes a kind of institutionalized, over-institutionalized um, disciplinary um, project. Um, it, it, it does lead to something sinister. And I, and I think Taylor is right as well, that this is a big factor in secularization, that it, it, it seems to suggest that the heart of things is the ethical and that the kind of religious bit can slip away. But, but yes, you're right in the sense that what I'm arguing for is... Um, Again, something Augustinian rather than something medieval after Galatius, in that I think that the state is sort of both outside and in the church, in the sense that I think it needs to be outside because it's, it's going for compromises, it has to use dubious solutions, um, um, it, it, uh, and, and so forth. Um, but at the same time, um, it, it somehow should be serving this project of reconciliation. And this is the bit where I say the things that, you know, people are going to scream about, you know, um, because this is where I, I argue that we do need to carry on in the West recognizing the primacy of the Christian church. And I, I think that Tocqueville's reading of America is actually a very Catholic reading. He reads America almost um, as if it's kind of well, he says so, that it's favorable to Catholicism because he reads it as saying that the reason America works is that there's something sustaining intermediate institutions between the individual and the state, and this is this church space. And that, the, that there is this, although there are all these sects, and that's a problem because I think it makes America too deistic somehow. Nonetheless, America is weirdly Gothic and medieval, and this is what Maritain thought as well, that, that because there is this recognition of kind of the church level. And, and again, my argument is, if you don't have that, you don't have the secular either. And pe people's minds are changing incredibly fast. There was an article in the New Statesman, of all things, I read it on the plane, this is, you know, the British left-wing organ, arguing that the Pope is actually right to protest that nothing is said about Christianity in the European Constitution. You know, it's as if, because the European Constitution sounds as if you go from antiquity to um, the Enlightenment and nothing in between. And he was saying, well, but in, that, in a way, don't you get rid of this radical thing um, about reconciliation? You get rid of Canossa when, you know, a pope, an emperor in the snow who has all the armies has to bow down before the pope. In a sense that, you see, that 
not um, you know, what happens after the wars of religion, if you like, is, is the key moment of secularization. And that, you know, if you lose all Christian, it's very dialectical. If you lose all Christian reference, you actually lose the secular. You see, and I, I felt part, your book was quite close to saying that when you were talking about all this Rousseau stuff. You were well, close to saying that. Well, I think that it, <clears throat> what's becoming clear to me as we're talking is that from my point of view, there is um, a kind of elision for you between the ambition of theology to think the whole and the <coughs> ambition of the ecclesia to be the whole. Now, for me, the task of philosophy is to understand the whole. But now its task, I mean, for me as someone who's committed to liberalism, is to understand from the point of view of the whole why liberalism works. Now, it's possible for you to want reconciliation in thought and not want reconciliation in life. You want both. I don't, because I've come to be suspicious not of reconciling things in thought, but in trying to bring it about in history. And that's why I'd be interested to hear you talk, um, I guess, less about you know, the references going back in the tradition and think more about the present and future, what would politics look like on this vision? I, I actually don't know. I mean, in one of the essays in your collection, I don't, I don't. there's a talk of Eucharistic anarchism. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, but just addressing your concerns for a moment, it seems to me that you, when you're talking about Rousseau, you, you're strongly recognizing um, you know, this question about what actually what actually psychologically motivates people um, and the way in which you know, um, people bind together societies under shared visions and so on. And that this is something, if you like, that's not completely liberal. So that Rousseau is a bizarre mixture in the sense you know, the isolated individual has this kind of primacy. But then when we get into, uh, when you meet other people, um, um, he, he's sort of, um, he, he's starting to recognize you know, the primacy of, 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 of relationality and the way that's the source of both, you know, both evil and, and good. But then the, the, it, you know, most of the 19th century French liberals were, including Tocqueville, were recognizing that you, you have to qualify liberalism in, in terms of um, this question of you know, why, why do people really act? And you know, even the Scots tradition about sympathy and so on is, is in a way um, qualifying liberalism because it's, uh, it's this, this question of that, you know, what binds people together and um, this is, is somehow more than liberalism. And it seems to me that you're sort of saying, you sort of recognize that this is realistically true um, but then you're saying, well, you don't like it because you know it leads to something nasty, and I think that's true. No, no, but, no. but isn't the problem that that we have a kind of ersatz version of this? That you know, when religion in the 19th century gets associated strongly with nationalism, and that you know, part of the problem all the time is the absolutely sovereign state, and then the nation state, which, let's be honest, is a racist state. You know, um, and and. And, and in a way, um, if you had real religion, if you, if you talked about the real, you know, the real sort of church community, um, um, you would, um, this, this, this might be actually kind of less dangerous because you've got this idea here of the, of the actual transcendence of, of, of the political. So you've got the idea of something that's continuously self-critical, but I mean, as Ron Williams has said very well, that you know the West continues this negative critique that Christianity started, but but it it's it's now kind of nihilistic. It's it's not in in it's not in favour of anything else. So that it it's, it becomes like a negative theology that's become nihilistic because you're not hope, holding open this kind of church space of something we haven't quite got yet, but are trying to get towards. But I, I, th I think what I'm saying actually um, is, 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 is perfectly concrete in the sense that um, 
Yes, I'm in, I'm in favor of a kind of distributive socialism. In other words, I, I, want, to, um, I want us to um, return, somehow engineer you know, a far greater distribution of, of property uh, and, 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 and power. And I want us to end this artificial separation between um, the economic and the political on which liberalism is built. So I'm with Chesterton and Belloc here that I think we need to, um, we need to uh, return to other potentialities within the Middle Ages. So I reject all this stuff about we live in modernity. I'm a, you know, like Latour, we, we've never been modern. We just live in one medieval project. This is part of what radical orthodoxy is trying to say. We live in a scotist Occamist space. So we're still in, we still live in the Middle Ages, but we need to live in a different Middle Ages. <laughs> and 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 uh, so and you know the as Belloc said, you know the Middle Ages had taken so far this getting rid of slavery, um, the the you know the idea of the free independent peasant, the idea of independent artisans in guilds. Uh, um, it had some principles of a market economy that wasn't yet a capitalist economy. It hadn't yet quite escaped from feudalism, but we need to return and, and go forward. Um, you know, all this stuff about, you know, do you want to go back to the Middle Ages? Are you pre-modern, modern? None of that is, is complex enough to capture what has really happened. And, and people again and again are inclined to think that there's something inevitable. You know, I, I come from Peterhouse, where we invented attacking the Whig theory of history. And this is what you have to go back to again, again, and again. Modernity is just an accident. It's just one way things happen to have gone. It's only because the English peasants lost their property. It's only because an English king dissolved the monasteries. That's why we have modernity. This is the way you need to think. It's only because Napoleon marched across Europe that Christianity has declined. Sorry, that this is, is, is your view or is it your view? To think. That is not your view. No, that is the way I think. But it's absolutely contingent. None of this is inevitable. But, 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 but you tell the story that it's all been, you know, I don't say I can hold both of these things mm. together, that if you say that to really unlock the key to what's happened, you don't have to say, well, stuff happens, uh, but rather that this is the working out of the logic of a theological debate in the 11th century, and, you know, it reminds me of, uh, I, forget no, no. What, I forget what poet it was who said that, you know, poetry's been going downhill since the Homeric no, no, deviation. No, genealogy isn't inevitable like that. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to dig out what are the hidden presuppositions because, you know, I'm a historicist in, in that sense. And I don't think that I've got a greater genealogical disease than you have, Mark. I just think your your genealogy is truncated because you're you're saying, oh, um, secularity has come about, you know, because there were wars of religion and because re of religious fanaticism. And I think this it's not as simple as that, and that it comes about because of all kinds of stuff going on in the Middle Ages, and that you know Hobbes could only have done what he'd done because all the intellectual tools were ready prepared for him by people like. Um, um, like William, uh, William of Ockham. Um, nor do I think that religion is sort of as such fanatical. I think Protestantism is fanatical. Yeah, I yeah. think iconoclasm is fanatical. I think that people who don't have doctrines, like Muslims, tend to be fanatical. Well, W.H. Auden had this right. If you don't have doctrines, then any old trivial stuff becomes important. Headscarves become important, for God's sake. You know, um, on, on whether you're for them or, or against them. You know, you can't distinguish what matters any longer. So it's, it's, it's a particular kind of religion that is, is fanatical. And especially it's to do with smashing images and people who think God can't be mediated. If you smash images, you also smash people's faces and, and, um, and you think you have a direct line to God, which we don't because you've forgotten the idea of analogy. So I just reject this idea that, that I, the problem is the breakdown of Catholic Christendom. It's not religion in general. Right, but one the, of the problem but, is the heretics. But, 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 <laughs> but, one, but one of the consequences of that um, is that what... And I, I guess it's the closest <clears throat> I come to... Uh, I don't think... A, 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 
can I get some help with this? Um, I don't think of it as a genealogy. I think it more, more as an account of a miracle. That out of all of this, an idea was born that people legitimately govern themselves and that all the other questions that haunted us, where that fit in, we don't have to ask for the purposes of politics. Now, um, I understand that out of that many ideas were born and we can discuss which ones we consider to be true liberalism, deviations from liberalism, and all the rest. But that seems to me to be a real break. And that in the way that you know, Blumenberg talks about the same break you do, but from a different angle, after that break, it reshuffles the cards. This is a genuinely new idea about politics. Now, if you don't accept that idea about politics, which you don't, it seems to me you're obliged to say more than you have about what politics will look like. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that on this question, too, in your book, there's some sliding around. Um, because even the way you described it when it comes to the exercise of authority, the fundamental political question from the point of view of liberalism, you talk about the exercise of authority as a tragic reality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, <clears throat> at this point, when you were talking about Augustine and having to deal with the state, it has to be in and out. Uh, it seems to me there, you know, you're going towards a kind of dualism there of separating out politics, and you won't follow the logic of your thought. Follow the logic of your thought, mm -hmm. which is to say, no, they're one. We think them as one, and the state is part of this. A it's one, not. It's what's one? Sorry. The one being the ecclesia. Okay. And that um, there's not tragic realities and non-tragic realities, there's reality. And politics is part of it. And this is the whole that we think. Now, that seems to me, as you say, a Catholic alternative, that's the real alternative to what I'm talking about. It's a more respectable one, mm -hmm. from my point of view, because it, it provides an alternative to, it, it highlights what's different about liberalism that liberalism brackets. And it's the bracketing, not the anthropology, because we can, you know, we can talk about anthropologically uh, what's missing, I mean, in Hobbes' vision. I mean, yeah, mm. as I do. But the task for us, it seems to me, after this has happened, is to somehow, as the French say, make two things into one. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, Hobbes got politics right while getting the anthropology wrong. Rousseau got the anthropology right while getting the politics wrong. Solve. So, what, 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 yeah, no, and I, I absolutely agree. I felt I'm interested in you saying that because I, 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 reading your book, it was as if you were siding with Hobbes, and yet the whole book was building up to this is the aporia. And, and this is why I'm suggesting, actually, that the solution to this aporia is clearly a Catholic solution because... To repeat, you know, if we can make the anthropology um, directed towards a trans-political community, in other words, a community um, that is going beyond the purposes of politics, which are sort of kind of like some sort of peace or, or you know, punishing the wicked or managing things, if, if we're going towards total reconciliation, but at the same time, you, this is a critical enterprise because you know we're not quite getting there yet. So there's this eschatological dimension. But, but, but this not, is precisely but, the way you resolve your aporia. No, 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 because you haven't solved my problem. Because part of my problem was how do you hold on to what we've achieved with liberal politics? And that is something, and that's where you're not, from my yeah, point of view, not saying enough. No, I understand. Well, and, I, and, and that is how do you hold on to the politics that Hobbes based on a crazy anthropology yeah. with a wider, richer anthropology yeah. that Rousseau gets without all the well, political I, 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 problems. I think, and, and if I think I at that point, at that point, you say, well, Who are you? That when, you, when you have to go liberal, <laughs> this is always like a kind of disappointment in the sense because it's always to do with the libido dom, 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 dominandi in Augustinian sense, you know, that I'm, I'm not committed to a kind of naturalizing of our sort of individualism and selfishness. I'm more with Rousseau that it's, it's a kind of choice. Um, although at the same time, you know, I think we are more 
corrupted than he, he's saying. But, but I, um, but uh, what I am saying is that, um, you know, by, by not, by, by not, by not naturalizing that, um, you know, one, one is holding open um, uh, something else, even, even if you like, in the political realm, or even something that the political can um, aspire to. And if, if you like, what we're seeing in, you know, in, the, in the present crisis is that where you allow the libido dominandi to run riot, it doesn't even make sense, you know, that when individuals are sort of, you know, it's been said, just make your own calculations, eventually they start to do insane things like treating debt as if it's an asset um, and, and making apparent money out of debt. And it turns out that actually there's no invisible hand saving um, this process at all. And at that point, you have to start thinking again, at least to some degree, about, you know, why do we have finance? We, in what way does the economy serve society and the political? You know, when, it, when the crunch comes, you know, in, in the real political sense here, it turns out that, you know, nations, after all, have to reassert themselves. They can't just let the economy dominate. You know, it's not going to... It, it becomes untrue. But, and, you, but, but you can do all of that and think about yeah. all of that while still assuming that human beings legitimately rule themselves. Because what you talk about yeah. in, in your book is not uh, a richer anthropology to cool. You talk about supernaturalizing the natural. Yeah. Well, I, I, that, that, that's right. Um, and that's because um, I, I, I think that in, inevitably, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, what's authoritative, what's the good, or something like that, you're invoking, or the common good, you are invoking something like um, a mythical um, transcendent di dimension. Um, you know, at, at the heart of what makes all the signifiers work, if you like, is, as Levi Strauss said, an X that doesn't have any immediate reference. And um, this is, if you like, the space of the, the mythical and the transcendent. And I think this idea um, that you can have um, pure self-government is, is untrue. I think, for one thing, it, it, it's a kind of formalism that suggests that nothing is ruling and that we're sort of, dis, you know, the miracle you're talking about. And it's true. People had never had this thought before. They're, they're, they're saying somehow out of the mere formal rules we can distill um, a kind of order. And, and I think the problem about that is that... Um, the formalism is, is is backing arbitrary power. It's it's uh, it's the people then who, um, if you like, cream off the, the the bureaucratic surplus value of those rules, or it's the people who are creaming off the surplus value of economy who are ruling. It, to put this in Marxist terms, um, but but at, 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 the, uh, um, at the same time, I think something beyond that, and this is the sort of Schmittian point, I would add. Is, is that actually um, something mythical will always fill the heart yeah. of this empty, empty formalism. Yeah, I, um, guess, I guess my view is that all of the, those are withdrawal symptoms. You'll get over it. Um, and, and that's what uh, that whole line of thinking is, is that you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, but trust me, political theology is there. If we send the canary into the mine, it'll die. It's... it's, it's uh, it's this secret thing holding it together instead of just admitting the obvious that nothing holds it together anymore and we get by. And what do you do about the biopolitical problematic? You know, is this, is this self-ruling thing, is it natural or, or is it, or, or is it um, cultural and constructed? And, it, uh, you know, and it turns out to be, you know, aporetically both at once and, and we want to, well, you know, to... we want to, as Latour says, we want to divide off the natural and, and, and the cultural as if we, whereas in fact they're, you know, they're always already blended, which means that, um, we, we, you know... The, well, for the, the reason Aristotle gave, man is the creature that by nature departs from his nature. Yeah, but that, that's... Exactly, Aristotle did not have modern. But he says we're a political animal. 
which means that he, he, the liberal is biopolitical in the sense he's trying to deal with a pre-cultural nature, um, you know, about which we can't really say anything because really we have to have decided already in cultural terms, you know, we decide him as a fearful, you know, that man is naturally fearful or, or economical or, um, or something like this. And, and it also means that kind of outside... Um, Outside the political realm, um, it, it turns out that you know if you don't subscribe to that, you lose you lose everything natural after all. Paradoxically, this is why people can uh, this is why people can land up in Guantanamo Bay. But but Aristotle is saying quite different something quite different. He's saying of our very animal nature, we are political. We are teleologically intended to live in in cities. This isn't what liberals say. No, but you can have a yeah. view of man as a political animal, and one of the things he can do as a political animal mm -hmm. is say, for the purposes of the exercising of political authority, this is what we're going to do. We're going to limit ourselves to these things, to protecting ourselves against the worst harms, and we'll either leave people in their other social relations or individually to cope with uh, the remainder. But, but I agree with you that... Mm -hmm. What is lacking in the little story I tell is someone who can solve the problem and say, okay, give us a new account of man as a political creature that makes sense of the fact and from my point of view of the success of liberal government. Mm -hmm. But, well, I, I think that it tends to turn into a, a kind of relentlessly disciplinary project. You know, this, the, Foucault is right about this because once you've said, oh, the worst harms... Um, they, these turn out sort of not to be finite, and, and you, you, you get endlessly worried about, um, you know, um, w what is inhibiting somebody else's freedom, or you, you start to see all interference by somebody with somebody else as a, as, as a kind of violence, because, you know, after all, you know, even to interact with anybody is, is to sort of impose stuff on them. And, th and then you get this kind of endless policing, endless disciplining, so that it, it, it turns out not to be merely this formal contractualist thing, but it has this disciplinary process um, at, at, it, at its very, very, very heart. And, you know, like political correctness is always on the horizon, if you like. Well, that was before Foucault went to, went to uh, California and discovered that it's not all discipline, it's also fun. He, he got a whole lot less gloomy after that. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> we have about he, went, he went to California. Anyway, we have about 15 minutes left, and I'd like to bring this into um, a, a different realm uh, with a final question <clears throat> before we um, open the floor to the audience. Um, you invoked uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Williams, um, previously, and he, of course, recently said that um, the... That the UK may need to find a place for Muslim law, Sharia, mm -hmm. within um, the way within its larger uh, legal order, and he said in the way that we have already accommodated other religious mm -hmm. law. I'm I'm curious, um, given the now we're on the other shore, we're on the um, state of uh, with plural religions. I, I'm curious what your response to that is um, as a, a thinker coming from. Uh, your tradition. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think the problem with uh, Rowan's speech, which you know all his advisors told him don't give, um, was that he, he appeared to be saying that Sharia law could actually be in conflict with British law, say in relation to marriage law, and you could sort of choose which one to, to go for. And um, people immediately said, including a lot of Muslim women, well, you know, we wouldn't have a free choice. We'd be under huge internal pressure to go for Sharia law, even though we didn't really like it. And soon after that, Rowan retracted and said, no, he was only talking about instances where um, things like marriage negotiations or Islamic ways of conducting mortgages are not incompatible with British law, that procedures are a little different, but they're compatible, uh, and they could actually be useful. 
and this already goes on in relation to Judaism. It's been going on for a hundred years in, under British law, you know, that, that certain things are dealt with internally. Um, but, but, but there's no sense, but Rowan appeared to be talking about a kind of choice of jurisdictions. Um, and I think at that point, a kind of multiculturalist legalism had entered into his thinking, um, which he, he seemed to quite quickly uh, forswear and quite rightly in, in, in my view. Um, there's a sense in which the only kind of pluralism that can work here is a much more organicist pluralism. You know, if, if we can recognize that there are certain, in our own terms, that there are certain goods pursued by um, Islamic communities, certain, for example, certain kind of tacit modes of self-control, you know, that, that's, that's great. But, but, but in a way, then, you're, you're, you're seeing how this contributes to the overall good of, say, Britain, as we're talking about, about um, Britain here. So that, yeah, for sure, um, Sharia approaches could have a, a role in, 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 certain, in certain areas. Um, but unfortunately, we're talking about a situation where, you know, already people are demanding legalized polygamy and... Um, uh, and other things that you know do challenge the principles of our Western way of, way of life. And here, no, I mean, I mean, I think it's very clear to me living in the UK, far clearer than when I lived in America, actually, that you know, uh, Islam is a problem unless it reinvents itself in a more sort of depoliticized kind of form, because it just is a political religion in a way that's just not compatible with our yeah. Western... And people in religious studies departments, they, I mean, they all talk nonsense. Most of them talk nonsense about all yeah. this, in my view. Yeah, no, we agree about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, but I was glad to hear you say that, well, we've been doing this for 100 years uh, with the Jewish community, um, uh, which is right in the sense that, you know, the apocalyptic picture you have sometimes of... You know, uh, you know, a worse tyranny than since uh, ancient man. Um, in fact, you know, the, the state limits itself, and it can, the liberal state can limit itself. <clears throat> and it can say that the law extends this far, the written law. It can be silent about other things. Mm -hmm. And as long as things aren't incompatible, we don't care about that stuff. The only thing that matters, and this is where it was unclear in Williams' statement, I didn't follow the second one, is it wasn't clear uh, whether he thought that Sharia should then have standing, as we say here, mm -hmm. in the legal system. And that's the line from the point of view of liberalism uh, that you can't cross. But, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, let's take a lesson from this. We can do this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And, it's, and we can do it without having to think about how does this contribute you know, to the human good in a, in a comprehensive way in the community, we actually can lower the bar a little bit mm -hmm. well, and, think, and let it go on. I think it's sort of pragmatic, but it means there's some kind of shared notion. I mean, it's like the way the British public education system, I mean, the state system, uh, has religious schools within it, which would, yeah. it's unthinkable. And pays for them, in, and they don't in hear. In American terms, and yet, yeah. in yeah. reality, it works. It's not, yeah. in reality, a problem. And, and I think that what was really firing Rowan here was much more the issue of the rights of collective bodies. He was back to this kind of old Maitland Figgis Acton question, you know, do corporate bodies yeah. have rights? And uh, particularly, for example, you see Catholic adoption agencies in Britain have had to shut down because they, they're not accepting gay adoption. And, you know, they argued for exemptions and pluralism and so on. And, and I think Rome was partly addressing that situation because on the horizon, there are people who are saying you should outlaw people who say you can't have women priests. And I'm in favor of women priests, but I'm not in favor of the state saying that churches have to do that. But there are definitely people arguing this kind of thing now. So, and th so the issue is, you know, what's the rights of corporate bodies as against... Uh, you know, this is, can be quite a tricky issue for liberalism because I think that, you know, the ultimate logic of liberalism always tends to see, you know, favor the priority of the individual. But, you know, the idea of rights to corporate bodies tends to involve more notion of, well, what we, 
what role are they playing in the public good? Like, we can let the Baptist church be self-governing because we kind of see it's, it's, it's more a good thing than a bad thing, you know. It, 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 that's the kind of thinking, I think, that's going on here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you. I would like to take questions from the audience for mm. Chuck. There's a microphone in the middle, so if you could mm. come forward, you'll be recorded. Hi. Um, my name is Chuck Matthews. Uh, I'm one of the other participants <clears throat> tomorrow. Uh, Professor Lilly, you had mentioned that Foucault eventually went to California and changed his mind. I'd, I'd encourage both of you, actually, to take a little trip with me to California. Oh, um, that's too dangerous. <laughs> it could be fun. Well, we've California been there together. I'm think, sorry. This could be great. What I mean, though, is um, for both of you, there seems to be a surprising lacuna in your thought, um, in, in The Stillborn God and, and in much of what you've written, John, uh, about the, the fact of the one liberal society that seems remarkably godly and yet not really to have many of the problems that seem to be pressing in these complicated ways on the liberal imagination or the theopolitical imagination, uh, John. And that is, of course, the US. Uh, at the beginning, Professor Lilla, you said that um, you and uh, Professor Milbank share a disdain for the middle um, from your different shores. And I think I could speak for myself and most of the people in this room who are the scholars of or perhaps participants in that middle in some way or other. And for several hundred years, that middle has been middling along. Um, mm -hmm. If there's a model of success in liberal society, it seems to me to be one that involves some kind of weird consociation of religiosity and liberal intuitions. I think in some ways they've reinforced each other. And a long line of what I think of as properly liberal thinkers, from Madison through Tocqueville, through uh, up to people like Reinhold Niebuhr and people today, actually suggest that this is a um, reinforcing, although complexly reinforcing, especially someone like Tocqueville, complexly reinforcing um, inter interrelationship. So it's just surprising to me that um, I feel like in listening no, to no, you, I'm no, hearing no, the same no, conversation yeah, no, I would have heard no, between, nowhere, nowhere, between Nietzsche and Overbeck 100 nowhere, years ago, and it seems like it's the same thing. No, no, but neither of you ever actually look across Chuck, the pond. Chuck, so no, I just want to have you think about what's I've, going on in I've the United been, States. I've been, Thank the, you. I've been across the pond, and the, nowhere is the biopolitical more problematic than in the US, because this is why it's got so much crime, because you know liberalism doesn't explain why you shouldn't keep going back to nature, in inverted commas. Um, nor does it explain why, you know, at the heart of, um, you know, the, 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 the civil kind of le le legal thing, um, you shouldn't be sort of bending it so absolutely towards, you know, self-interest that, you know, whether you're, whether you're the president or the head of a board, that again, it, it's going to veer off in, in, in a kind of criminal direction. And that this, you know, this is why criminality just plays such a huge role. In, in, um, I mean, it's it's also why you have to keep things bland most of the time, of course, you know, because the danger is just round the corner, you know. So, you, so that you have to qualify this with endless kind of civility. But I, I wasn't really quite sure what you were asking. I mean, why is America? Why is it showing something different? Well. Let's see if Mark has a... Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I guess I just have to repeat what I said earlier to make clear that the argument of the book has nothing to do with secularization. Nothing. And so it's about the principle of the legitimation of authority. In the United States, we have a system that is liberal in that sense, and people can be as religious as they like. Now, that may help. It may cause problems. So I felt I was talking on every page about the American situation without saying I'm talking about America as well here. Um, but America is, you know, this is why I said in one line of the book that um, you know, it was no accident that the best analyst of modern democracy, i.e. especially American democracy, was a Frenchman who was a student of Rousseau. That's and, Montesquieu. That, and Montesquieu, that's right, that's Tocqueville. But, you know, my line on the United States is that um, what's recognized here is that human beings legitimately rule themselves. Damon, Damon Linker, I think, is probably going to argue tomorrow that, uh, well, it's not so clear that all Americans agree about that. So, we, you know, you, you, you can have a debate about that. But, but I, I think we agree.
No, the, the stillborn God, it, no, 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 the stillborn God is, is the God of a liberal theology that thought it could find a, that it could somehow fudge the issue of who legitimately exercises authority. Do human beings do it autonomously or don't they? And the 19th century tradition tried to somehow avoid that question. Well, for fear of being labeled a tyrant, uh, we do need to draw this to an end. And uh, 8 o'clock is the hour that we agreed upon for ending. So we can say that we did rule this uh, through self-rule. Um, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Professor John Milbank and Professor Mark Lilla for this uh, wonderful conversation. And I uh, encourage you to attend the panel discussions tomorrow. As well, uh, as I mentioned before, please pick up the, um, the note about, or the poster about the Charles Taylor lecture next week, uh, which will be equally engaging. Thank you again. Thank you.